thanks, um, thanks Carol for the invitation, and thanks everyone for, for braving the torrential downpour uh, to come and see me. We wanted today. to make you feel at home. Yeah, no, no, I, this is my first trip to New York, and, uh, and the heavy rain reminds me of London. So, anyway. So, <clears throat> today's talk is going to be about um, one aspect of technological change and the effects that it's going to have on the labor market, focusing specifically on how policymakers should respond to that threat. I emphasize one aspect because I think that technological change is going to have a, a plurality of effects on the labor market, and with that bring a, a variety of breaks and opportunities to which policy makers will need to be responsive. So, by way of illustration, think about, for example, the, the rise of the, the gig economy, or the, the on-demand economy, whereby employees find out their shifts at, at late notice, and are able to agree or reject those shifts as they see fit. This is a kind of rising trend, we might think, and it brings certain threats and opportunities, depending upon the point of view we adopt. On the one hand, we might think, for example, that with the gig economy, employees enjoy greater flexibility. They're able to select their shifts when they want. This is going to be able to better serve their interests. It might, in fact, better serve the interests of children and the elderly who parents care for. The flexibility might serve the interests of those individuals. But alternatively, if one adopts a different perspective, we might think what the gig economy brings is not flexibility, but unpredictability. We might think the real problem is that employees find it difficult to know when their shifts are going to be, and this can make it difficult for them to plan their time. As a result, they might have to rely upon the, the favours of friends and family to help them out. It might stress those relationships, this might have deleterious effects on children and the, and the elderly. I mentioned this example not because it's the focus of today's talk, but simply because I want to illustrate a different and additional way in which technology is going to affect the labour market and that policymakers will need to respond to. Today I'm going to focus on specifically the issue of, of automation, which I think is the most well-known issue, and the issue that, that grabs the headlines. So, <clears throat> automation occurs when, as a result of technology, firms decide to displace or lay off their employees. A firm might decide either to sack an employee, or when growing, to invest in technology rather than to expand their workforce. It's predicted by some that we'll see, as a result of this trend, a, a, raise, a rise in, in unemployment. There's a kind of extremist view that we see most commonly in, in newspapers and, and, and other forms of the media that predict that the effects of technology and the effects in particular of automation is going to lead to, to mass unemployment. We're going to see a world whereby the demand for human labor has been replaced by technology such that we'll see significant proportions of our society in a, a permanent state of unemployment. Except for philosophy professors, we hope. Yeah. Actually, there's, there's, this, there's this study. Uh, if you ask people um, which occupations do you think are, are least likely to be automated, the one that comes top normally is, is nursing. They say nursing is, is very unlikely to be automated. And the one that comes second is the person's own job. <laughs> so if you're a philosopher, you're going to say philosophy. If, you're, if you work in a supermarket, you're going to say jobs in the supermarket. We have a we have a very 
kind of divorced view of the threats of technological okay. innovation. <laughs> Go on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so there are some people, uh, we find it's mainly in the media who predict uh, in the long run there will be extreme unemployment. For what, it's for, for what it's worth, I don't think this view is widely supported in the academic literature. Labor market economists focusing on automation tend to report that this kind of prediction of mass unemployment is very unlikely. There tend to be two reasons for this. The first is that this prediction of mass unemployment misses the extent to which technology complements rather than substitutes for the demand for labor. So take, for example, uh, the introduction of the, of the ATM, get cash out of the wall. Since the, since the invention and widespread adoption of the ATM, what have we seen to the number of bank tellers who work in banks? They've doubled. The number of employees working in banks has doubled since the introduction of the ATM. The reason for this is that this new piece of technology has made it profitable for firms to, to set up new locations, new branches in locations that are otherwise unprofitable. So that's just a kind of a general story about how technology often complements rather than substitutes. Second reason for skepticism is about the about the, the fact of mass unemployment is is made by those who say the prediction of mass unemployment stems from a failure of our imagination. A hundred years ago, more than forty percent of the working population of the US were employed in agriculture. Had you asked them, in the year 2018, it'll be less than 2%. What jobs do you think people will be employed in? A hundred years ago, not many of them would have said Silicon Valley. We have an astonishing incapacity to predict the ways in which our labor will be demanded in the long term. The fact that we can predict new forms of demand for our labor doesn't justify the conclusion that we're all going to be unemployed. So I, I think we should be very cautious about listening or taking too seriously these stories of mass unemployment. However, that doesn't mean that everything's rosy. Specifically, even if in the long run we're going to find new forms of employment for individuals, still we should expect that in the short and medium run, there's going to be serious disruption as a result of automation. An individual who's worked as a, a truck driver all her life, it's little consolation to her to say that in a hundred years' time, there'll be new demands for her labor. The fact is, she's going to be made redundant, she's going to lose her job, and there's a question about whether that's going to be fair to her, whether we can compensate her, how we distribute the costs of automation in an equitable fashion. So, unlike some of the, the optimist economists who simply point to the future demand for labor in order to justify this phenomenon of automation, I think we need to take seriously the costs that we're going to experience in the, in the short and medium run. So in today's talk, I want to outline one proposal for how we should respond to the threat of unemployment, the threat of unemployment in, in the short and medium run. I'm going to look at two justifications for that proposal and argue that neither of them is successful. And then in the final, the briefest part of the talk, I'll show how my objections these two justifications support a rival policy. So I want to say that, that the policy I favor is going to emerge from my objections to the particular proposal on the table. The particular proposal that I'm going to look at is that of automation taxes. So these are taxes that the government levies on firms that choose to automate. So I'm focusing on, on, these, on this proposal for a couple of reasons. One is, I think that it's especially philosophically interesting. I think that it's going to illuminate the terrain 
in, a, in an important way. And second, these are especially politically controversial. So, uh, for example, in February 2017, the European Parliament rejected a proposal of this kind. The European Parliament considered the policy of automation taxes and, and rejected it. In the US, there have been similar proposals that have been considered, and in addition to, to politicians weighing in on the debate, we've also had public <coughs> figures. Bill Gates, for example, has offered his view on the justifiability of automation taxes. And in fact, in 2017, South Korea introduced an automation tax. The details of the policy are somewhat complex, um, but, I, but it's, it's sufficiently close for our purposes that we can, we can call it an automation tax. So, why might we be tempted by automation taxes? Briefly, I'm going to sketch two possible justifications, and then I'm going to look at them in a bit more detail. So, the, the first justification says, the reason that we should introduce automation taxes is to disincentivize automation. We should say to the firm, if you're considering automating, if you're considering that is laying off some employees or choosing to expand or grow the firm by investing in technology rather than employees, we want to discourage that by financially penalizing you. We're going to put a certain tax on your efforts to automate. This idea appeals to the fact that firms' decisions are going to be elastic in the sense that they're going to be responsive to the, the prices of the various options that they face. If we tax one option, say automating, then keeping the workforce looks like a comparatively more attractive strategy. We call this a kind of a disincentive argument for automation taxes. There's a second argument on the table as well. It says, the reason that we should introduce these taxes is not in order to disincentivize automation. It's simply in order to raise revenue. We want to raise tax revenue that we can then spend in various ways, including, for example, compensating <coughs> the victims of automation. We might say, if firms are going to automate, certain individuals are going to be made redundant, they're going to lose their jobs. If we have automation taxes, then the government has a larger pool of resources at their disposal that they can use to, to compensate those individuals. We call this the revenue argument. So we have the, the disincentive argument and the, the revenue argument. Of course, we might have the two of them together. In fact, many proponents of automation taxes advocate them on that basis. They say that, that both of these reasons supply us with good grounds for the introduction of automation taxes. I'm going to examine each of those in turn and suggest that they both fail. But before I do that, I think it's important just to prepare the, the ground a little bit by saying a bit more about the justifiability of automation taxes and, and the benefits that automation brings more generally. So, there are some people, critics of automation taxes, who are pretty dismissive of the policy from the get-go. They say, automation brings huge rewards. The fruits of automation are enormous. And we shouldn't jeopardize any process that's going to produce those benefits. And that alone provides us with sufficient reason to reject automation taxes. What might, what might this kind of dismissive approach look like? One version of it appeals to a simple utilitarian criterion. It says something like as follows. If we allow automation, then we're going to achieve a higher level of productive efficiency than would otherwise be possible. And the fruits that are made possible by that are so large that we're going to be better off, all things considered, than we would be under any scheme that had automation taxes, or indeed, any policy that stifled automation. 
The moral criterion to which they're appealing is something like the following. When selecting between various policies, we should opt for, what, for the one that maximizes the benefits and minimizes the burdens on aggregate. What matters is that overall benefits are maximized by promoting aut automation and that the reverse is true for policies that stifle automation. Sometimes uh, labor market economists adopt a particularly curious language of efficiency to defend this kind of utilitarian criterion. Specifically, they appeal to the idea of what's sometimes called Caldor-Hicks efficiency. Very briefly, Caldor-Hicks efficiency is when the gains made possible by one policy are sufficient that they could hypothetically compensate for the costs that that policy imposes on others. So if, for example, as a result of rapid automation, we see enormous gains to one class in society and sizable losses to another class in society, but the losses are sufficient that they could hypothetically compensate for the losses, then the policy would be Caldor Hicks efficient. And so some economists want to defend automation, rapid automation, on that ground alone. For those with any training in political philosophy, and indeed for most people without, it will be obvious what's problematic about that kind of proposal. Namely, that the utilitarian criterion and the Caldor Hicks account of efficiency is insensitive to the distribution of benefits and burdens. All that matters is that the gains are sufficiently large that they could hypothetically compensate for the losses. If, as I think is a likely result, automation produced enormous gains for people who are, who are already wealthy, for people who are already very talented, for example, for people who are already comparatively privileged, then according to this utilitarian criteria, that could be justifiable if they outweigh the burdens that are imposed on the least advantaged within society. But that strikes most of us as deeply unfair. This is a deeply counterintuitive result to think that the benefits of some can justify losses to others. So I think we should resist this kind of utilitarian defense of automation, this kind of utilitarian critique, dismissiveness of automation taxes. A second, more interesting suggestion come from those who say, not that automation or rapid automation is justified by virtue of a utilitarian criterion, but instead that it's justified because it satisfies a Pareto criterion. Broadly, the Pareto criterion states that a policy is just if some people benefit and no one loses out. If the policy, the introduction of this policy, means that a large number of people, some people benefit and no one loses out, well, the fact that no one loses out, according to this view, means that no one can possess a valid complaint against that policy. After all, the policy is not ready to be worse off. So there are some economists who think that we can appeal to the, the principle, the, 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 the Pareto criterion, in order to justify automation. I think, again, that this is going to fail for some fairly straightforward reasons, of which I'll, I'll list just three. First, it seems to me highly unlikely that automation in fact does benefit each and every one of us. Try saying that to the individual who has lost her job after 30 years of employment. True, she may get certain consumer benefits as a result of automation, but it's very unlikely, I think, that in all cases, those will be sufficient to defeat the particular costs that she bears as a result of redundancy or something like that. A second reason to be skeptical of the correct it, it is, is more specifically to do with the Pareto criteria itself, namely that I think it's too permissive 
a criterion. So I'll give a, a kind of a more philosophical example to illustrate the point. It's one that's uh, defended or developed by Shauna Schifrin. She says, imagine that there's some eccentric billionaire who wants to benefit the members of this audience uh, by giving away his or her gold bullion. And suppose that the eccentric billionaire can't physically hand the gold bullion to each of us, and so instead takes his or her aircraft and drops it from a height above us. Some of us might be seriously damaged when the bullion hits us. But even those of us who have our arms broken by the gold debris are going to be made better off overall by the eccentric billionaire's decision to fly the aircraft and drop the gold. So on the Pareto view, it's uncontroversial that the eccentric billionaire acts justifiably since it benefits each of us and makes no one worse off overall. Intuitively, however, that seems like the wrong verdict. It seems like, at least sometimes, it can be wrong for the eccentric billionaire to drop bullion on us in that way, even if we concede that I would be a net beneficiary, or each of us would be a net beneficiary. The prospect of having our arms or legs broken by a falling piece of gold is sufficient, at least in some cases, to render the act wrongful. So I think, in the case of automation, we might think it's true that automation does benefit each and every one of us. But if there are specific harms involved, the mere fact that we benefit overall from this process is not sufficient to justify the process in all cases. There's a further question going on here about how we weigh up the benefits and burdens in different cases. Finally, the third issue of the Pareto criterion is that if it's applied to our existing entitlements, that is, what we have here and now, the Pareto criterion is implausibly restrictive since it effectively forbids any redistribution from the overprivileged to the underprivileged. If we're taking from the millionaires in order to give to the poor, then that's not a Pareto improvement since we're rendering some people worse off than they were. So the Pareto principle applied in that case looks to be implausibly forbidding of certain kinds of redistribution. Now, defenders of the Pareto principle are going to revise it and refine it in certain ways, but I think that's going to continue to give rise to certain problems about which I can say. So with that in mind, I want to say that whilst it's true that automation is going to produce significant benefits, it's a mistake to think that those benefits automatically justify policies that promote automation. It's a mistake to think that those benefits alone, because they satisfy either the utilitarian criterion or the Pareto criterion, is sufficient to justify a promotive stance towards automation. The reasons for this are, are, are kind of varied, but often a common theme of my comments has been that they pay insufficient attention to the harms that the automation poses upon the least advantaged. I think that's why many people are drawn towards a policy of automation taxes. They recognize that automation has these specific damages towards the least advantaged and are concerned to protect their interests. With that in mind, having, I hope, motivated the case for automation taxes, having demonstrated, at least on, on the surface, why they might be appealing. I think we can now turn to examine the, the two specific arguments in their favor. So the, the first argument, the disincentive argument, holds that automation taxes are justified because they disincentivize firms from automating. When evaluating this claim, we have to think about are there other ways in which we can compensate or come to the assistance of individuals who are 
made redundant or lose their jobs as a result of automation. If there were these alternative mechanisms through which we could meet the claims of displaced employees, those individuals who were replaced by technology, for example, if there were other, other ways in which we could meet their claims, then their complaint against automation would be much less forceful because we could reply to these individuals by adopting these other mechanisms, we've rendered you no worse off than you were before. We can in fact even say, despite having been displaced, we've compensated you such that you're now even better off than you were before. For this reason, I think it's, it's vital that we reflect upon the different ways that we can compensate or assist individuals who are displaced by automation. Now, one familiar policy is to enact unemployment benefits or, or indeed generous unemployment benefits. That is, entitlements to regular financial payments made by those who are unemployed. We think that this serves as one way in which to compensate or mitigate the disadvantage suffered by individuals who are displaced by automation because we give these individuals income that they can then use to fulfill their life projects in various ways. Of course, in most countries we might be skeptical that the level of unemployment benefits that we currently witness are sufficiently generous. In fact, we might think the opposite. We might think they are kind of incredibly low, fails to even meet people's basic dignity, let alone give them sufficient resources with which to pursue other life plans. But we can remedy that defect simply by cranking up the level of unemployment benefits that people enjoy. Now, one problem with giving people mere unemployment benefits is that when an individual loses her job, she loses more than the income that she earns from it. Again, it's a little consolation to an individual who's been a truck driver for 30 years, now replaced by a machine, to say to her, you've got your unemployment benefits, you've been compensated. This fails to do justice to the myriad, in myriad of ways in which people benefit from employment. In addition to income, employment provides additional opportunities for self-realization opportunities to make a, a valuable social contribution. We might think it provides opportunities for external validation from others. In some cases, employment gives us a sense of purpose to our day, a sense of structure. With all these things in mind, I think we should be reluctant to see unemployment benefits as offering a sufficient method of compensation to those who are displaced by automation. Now, here it gets tricky. There are some people who want to say, it's true that in our world, employment offers a privileged context in which to attain this, this wide range of goods self-realization, social contribution, external validation, etc. But that's because, according to this objection, we live in a society that fetishizes employment of various kinds. They want to say, in an alternative society, we wouldn't fetishize paid employment of this kind. This is a regrettable feature of our society, one that we ought not to pander to. A specific version of this objection might go something like as follows. In fact, many people are able to get many of these goods that I've mentioned, self-realization, self-contribution, etc., outside of paid employment. Take, for example, the work of being a parent. Being a parent can offer opportunities for self-realization, opportunities to make a valuable social contribution, validation from others. The fact that we don't recognize the contributions of parents 
is merely a symbol of the fact that we live in a, a sexist society that fetishizes paid employment and to a large extent ignores the vital contributions that, that mothers make to our flourishing political community. These individuals say what we should do is seek to reform our society such that even though people are going to become unemployed as a result of automation, still they're going to enjoy opportunities to get, to get their hands on these goods. We might say, in our society, unemployment does prevent people from getting these goods. But in a future society, one in which there's more unemployment, one in which automation has had this effect, that wouldn't be so problematic because we could put other infrastructure in place in order to provide people with these kinds of opportunities. We could support them by subsidizing social clubs or, or other kinds of social environments by ensuring that individuals have opportunities to parent with dignity, for example. Now, I think there's great merit to this suggestion, and I, I do think that we should think critically about the fact that we live in a society where paid employment has such a central role in most people's lives. But, with that in mind, I think there are limits to the kind of argument that I've suggested. I think, specifically, that in any society where the majority of individuals are going to be remaining in employment, for those who aren't in employment, they will be seen as not living a normal functioning life, and that's going to bring with it certain forms of stigma, and other kinds of social bans. That's why I think it's so crucial to point out, as I did at the beginning of the talk, that we're not really considering a scenario of mass unemployment. In a world where 95% of us are unemployed, perhaps employment wouldn't be such a big thing. In that case, it wouldn't be a problem. There would be no social stigma attached to being unemployed. But in a world that more closely resembles our own, where vast numbers are going to remain in employment, I think it, we have significant reasons to treat employment as a distinctive good that we have reasons to promote. So, with that in mind, I think we should reach the conclusion that unemployment benefits alone are not going to be a satisfactory method of compensation. Does this mean that we should accept the disincentive argument and therefore automation taxes? No. The reason for this is we can supplement unemployment benefits with other policies. For example, policies whose purpose is to drive job creation. Policies whose purpose is to find new forms of demand for our labor. So one especially radical proposal that, around which there's been some interest is that of a job guarantee scheme where the state or government acts as an employer of last resort. It says to each of us, if you're unable to find a job in the market, then we'll give you a job. This would be one way in which governments could meet the undersupply of jobs and the risk that that poses. Much less extreme proposals are something like the following. Investment in labor-intensive industries. We might even think giving people cash the reason for this is that giving people cash has an enormous multiplier effect. If you give people cash, they go out and spend cash. That drives demand. That creates new forms of employment. So we might think that even though unemployment benefits alone aren't going to provide a, a satisfactory mechanism of compensation, if we supplement them with other policies that drive job creation, then we can overcome the problem. So I think that's the case. I think that we can say, providing that governments, rather than introduce automation taxes, instead provide individuals with unemployment benefits and adopt these other macroeconomic policies to drive job creation, then I think there's no reason to favor automation taxes over the alternative that I've described. And thus the disincentive argument is going to fail. Now, two very quick objections before I move on to the, the second argument. The first objection says, doesn't my argument rely upon privileging employment 
in a way that violates any, any reasonable standards of liberal political morality. I have in mind the objection coming from a, a particular flavour of Rawlsian, who upholds a, a principle of anti-perfectionism, for example, and says we ought not to privilege conceptions of the good that value employment over those that value leisure, for example. I think that this objection straightforwardly fails. The reason for this is, when I say that we should invest in macroeconomic policies that drive job creation, the reason for this isn't that employment is in itself more valuable than alternatives. It's simply that this is a, a more efficient way of meeting people's demands. People have interest in a wide range of goods, and this is just a, a more effective way of meeting them. It's just like delivering benefits in kind rather than cash. And if you, if you think that liberal political morality is consistent with delivering benefits in kind, then you should think that my proposal is consistent with liberal political morality. The second objection says that I've not done justice to the particular way, bless you, the particular way in which automation might harm individuals who lose out. It says, true Tom, we might be able to compensate individuals who lose their job by giving them unemployment benefits and by investing in other macroeconomic policies to drive job creation, but that's little consolation to someone who, 10 years before retirement, who lacks the skills to find new forms of employment, surely in that case there's going to be enormous costs to them. And saying to this individual, 10 years prior to retirement, why don't you retrain in this government-sponsored scheme? That doesn't seem to be a very satisfactory reply to their complaint. I think that this objection is very serious, and I think it's, it's supported by particular economic concerns on which I can elaborate if, if pressed. But I think here we can say to that individual, overall, you are a, a, a beneficiary of this system of automation. There's no way in which we can deliver these great benefits without you having to bear these costs. And that's crucial. We can say to the individual, you're, you're, you're being made worse off by this, by this particular episode of being made redundant. But the overall practice is beneficial, and there's, there's no alternative scheme here. This is a kind of imperfection, a second best about which we can do little. So I think we can offer a specific reply to the individual press as I can point. So, briefly summarising, I think rather than adopting automation taxes, we can instead supply people with unemployment benefits and engage in job creation. And that will meet the claims in as good a way. And so the suppliers will reply to the disincentive model. In the final few minutes, I want briefly to mention the, the revenue argument that I mentioned. The argument that says we adopt automation taxes in order to, to swell the pool of resources that we can use on funding the compensation mechanisms that I've described. If you want to fund unemployment benefits or job creation, where's the money going to come from? And defenders of the revenue argument say it should come from automation taxes. The challenge for proponents of this view is to explain why firms that automate are specifically liable to bear those taxes above and beyond other agents within our economy, including, for example, firms that don't automate. Why is it that we're justified in taxing the automating firms rather than the other firms? And I suggest there's no plausible answer to that. Now, the most obvious contender is to say that the firms that automate are, are responsible for these individuals being displaced. They are causally responsible for the plight that governments need to respond to. As a descriptive claim, I think that's true, but it's a mistake, I think, to conclude that causal responsibility of that kind can license taxes in the way that the revenue argument suggests. So, notice that firms that automate are under no obligation to hire individuals in the first place. 
So if I'm considering whether to expand my firm by investing in technology or, or growing my uh, workforce, I'm under no moral obligation to the potential applicants to invest in that strategy rather than to invest in technology. It would be a, a very serious mistake, I think, to impose those kinds of duties on firms. Second, more generally, it's an error, I think, to, to conclude that firms that um, produce harm within the economy thereby incur liability for that harm. So suppose that Carol runs a successful bakery, and suppose that I then set up a bakery, I, I then set up the bakery and uh, Carol's profits are reduced significantly as a result. There's an intuitive sense in which I've harmed Carol, I've reduced her income, but it's deeply counterintuitive to think that I incur any liability. It's deeply counterintuitive to think that I incur special obligations to Carol in virtue of setting up a successful bakery. Instead, to the extent that Carol is entitled to any assistance, it's an obligation that falls on all of us. I think the same is going to be true in automation cases, that if it's true that firms that automate are going to produce a need for this, the obligation to meet that need is going to fall on all of us, rather than specifically on firms that automate. So with that in mind, I think we can consider very briefly, I'll put together the pieces for the, the rival picture, which is rather than automate, uh, rather than introduce automation taxes, we should instead supply individuals with generous unemployment benefits, couple that with job creation strategies, and raise the revenue for that through general taxation, about which I've I said little, so open to corporation tax or to general income tax, for example, but I'm resisting the conclusion that it should be taxed and levied specifically on firms that automate. So I've outlined this rival proposal, which is more complex, which emerges from my specific objections to the disincentive argument and the revenue argument. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there at the end, there's like two moves that kind of make me uncomfortable. It's, uh, one, it has to do with this idea that the firms aren't under any obligations. So it seems to me yeah. like they're under a clear moral obligation to the employees that they make redundant yeah. for automation, right? Good. So they might want a special tax for redundancies rather than just like a tax on the investment in automation yeah. itself. Um, and then the second part, like I'm not entirely sure how comfortable I am saying that firms aren't under some sort of obligation to employ people at some rate in a special way, that if they come up with some scheme that is going to make them a lot of money, that we don't think, like, you have an obligation to uh, sort of compensate actors in the economic environment that makes it possible for you to engage in this scheme. Yeah. But they aren't under sort of a special responsibility because of their yeah. So you should go over this. Yeah, th thanks. Um, so but both of them are really uh, kind of spot on, I think. So um, what I want to do is, um, is resist a, a narrower conclusion, which is that um, firms that automate should be taxed in order to raise the revenue for compensating individuals who are displaced or failed to be hired. Um, it's consistent with that, of course, that firms do have particular obligations to their current employees. So if I, if I own a company, I have, spe I have special obligations not to fire my staff at very short notice. In fact, I think those obligations are so strong that they should be enshrined in law. I should be legally prohibited from doing that. I should make sure that I give my staff a certain period of notice, three months or six months, whatever. It might also be that I have to bear certain costs in, in severance pay, and giving them a redundancy package of some kind. So I agree with all of that, but I wanted to resist the more ambitious claim which is needed by defenders of automation taxes, that the firms that automate should be taxed in order to, to raise the revenue that will be used for things like retraining or investment in job creation or in order to generate employment benefits. Um, so 
you're right that um, my view is more accommodating of, of those kinds of obligations than perhaps I suggested. Um, but with that in mind, still, I, I think we have to really process the obligation. Um, and then on the second point about firms having an obligation to hire, so, so I do think that firms have an obligation to make what we might say some kind of social contribution. So if you take two firms, um, one that one that expands by hiring lots of staff, and one that expands by investing in technology. Of course, I would say both of them have obligations to contribute to society, so we should tax the profits of those firms at a very high level. But the mere fact that one has chosen to invest in technology rather than employment shouldn't, I think, justify imposing a high level of taxation on that firm in comparison with the firm that employs individuals and reaches a, a similar level of profit. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm objecting to what we might think of as kind of tax discrimination between firms that automate and for firms that don't. It's consistent, of course, with this. So you can have very demanding obligations on firms, especially on successful firms that make lots of money. We might think that they should be subject to levels of taxation that are, are much, much higher than we currently see and probably foresee in the near, in the near future. Um, so again, I think my view is, can accommodate, the, the, I think the concerns that you identify are spot on, but I think that my, I hope that my view can accommodate them um, without it collapsing into a defense of taxes. Mm. Yeah. Hi, so thank you very much. This is so interesting. Um, I'm really I was actually just wondering, um, you think, I mean, I, it's, it sounds like the way you've been talking about it, you think of automation as a harm to the employee uh, and a benefit to the employer yeah. uh, because they're making money and someone's losing a job. Uh, but I was just wondering how you think of, uh, there might be certain social benefits um, of automation. Yeah. Uh, that is, you might, the employer, and the employer doesn't always have to be a firm, could actually be the state. Yeah. Uh, and you might automate to reduce errors that are harmful to people. Yeah. Uh, and there might be, aside from that, those kinds of inefficiencies, you could also think of situations in which you might automate as a way of preserving human dignity. Uh, there are some jobs that are extremely yeah. dangerous and unpleasant. Um, that are worth automating. Yeah. And not just the jobs for those people, but you can also think of situations. It was funny that you mentioned nursing, because I was actually yeah. talking to uh, a labor law scholar who was saying, uh, when I get old, I would actually like um, nursing to be automated right. uh, because it's more dignified yeah. uh, for, for elder care, uh, yeah. if that could be done, right? Okay. Uh, and so there might be sort of those kinds of yeah. social benefits. And I was wondering, in the cases in which there are, how do we think about yeah. uh, the, the problem? Great. So, um, I, I agree with all of that. Um, so there, there are going to be a, a range of, of enormous social benefits. Um, some of those are going to be kind of separable issues. So take, for example, uh, it is a, a particular benefit of automation, or at least of some kinds of technology use that I think is especially interesting. Um, there's evidence that suggests that uh, the use of information technology within industries reduces the gender pay gap. So there's this wonderful work by uh, Claudia Golden, who's a, a Harvard economist, uh, documented, documenting the ways in which information technology makes part-time work more efficient, and therefore the wage penalty associated with part-time work is reducing. And she has some fascinating data that explores this. And I think it's totally right that in those cases, we're gonna have very special reasons to welcome automation and the use of particular forms of technology because of the social benefits they bring of reducing the gender pay gap, for example. That's true, but I want to say that's somewhat separable to the issue of unemployment and how we should think about the specifically the effects of, of automation on levels of unemployment. So I want to say we have reasons to welcome automation in that regard, and then there are, there are going to be different cases involving unemployment, and we might want to treat them separately. And then very, very briefly, just on the... Um, so I'm interested in cases where there are maybe dangerous forms of work or uh, you know, horrid, dirty forms of work that we think are better off automating than, than anything else. I think that's, that's certainly true, but I think there's a, one thing we shouldn't overlook here is that um, in, the case of very, in the case of kind of deplorable work, dirty, dangerous work, there is also an additional way in which we can meet that problem, which is 
we can pay those employees a proper salary. So part of the problem of, you know, take the, take the job uh, historically of uh, clambering through a city's sewers in order to remove blockages. Kind of horrid, dirty work. Um, but in addition to that, it was pitifully paid. If this work had been paid as it should have been, had, had this work been paid at an appropriate level, such that people regarded this as it's horrid work, but it's, it's good pay, then we might be less impressed by the benefits of technology. So I, I do agree that technology brings up those benefits, but often the benefits that technology brings are so great, in part because of our moral failure to come to the aid of the, of the least advantaged employees. So we shouldn't overlook the fact that, um, that automation kind of casts over our moral values in that respect. Thanks, Sophia. All right. Uh, great arguments. Um, one argument that I might add to your contrary to taxation is yeah. that there's a kind of a, a, a mindset, which I would call a mistake, that perpetually thinks of automation or artificial intelligence as something that's happening in the future. Right. So as a student of computer science, I don't want to age myself, but let's say in 1980, um, where, say, a computation of the heuristic of how to do a mapping program in a city traffic would be yeah. unsolvable except with a supercomputer. Uh, where uh, people take automation, and as soon as automation becomes a product, it ceases to become automation. Now it's just a product. Yeah. And so it's now removed from the future automation that I used to be impossible, and yeah. now it's just the GPS locator in my cell phone. Yeah. Well, how can you possibly tie that automation to job displacement? Uh, does everyone who uses a GPS in their cell phone was a tax to the map makers or the printers of Grand yeah. McNally Maps that are now out of work. Yeah. The automation that you're talking about presupposes a direct displacement of one worker because of a robot yeah. and not the introduction to complex technologies that are ubiquitously used and yeah. are not yeah. directly affecting anyone. Yeah. You cannot tie a taxation to that kind of automation because it is being filtered to millions of users. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there, there's a couple of things to say there. So, um, one is uh, even advocates of the automation taxes are going to recognize that there are enormous epistemic problems. So, we can't identify, we can't say, Tom, you've been made unemployed as a result of the introduction of this piece of technology. And so, tying together the specific harms in that way. Is, a, is of course going to fail. But I think what, what advocates of automation, want, of automation taxes want to say is that as a general class of activity and a general class of victims, we can, we can tie them together. So we want to say that we, we can kind of smooth over some of these epistemic complications by saying that as a, as a rule, the firms that are doing this are harming those individuals. Just like we might say, for example, in the case of take, uh, Take an activity like, like smoking. So we can't say of any company that produces cigarettes, you're responsible for that person needing medical care. We can't draw it because it's just too epistemically complicated to say that that cigarette was the one that triggered the cancer of those series of cigarettes produced by that company. Um, but I take it that isn't going to impugn the justification of taxes on, on cigarettes because we want to say the class of activities that is producers of cigarettes in general should be tax liable for the, the harm suffered by you know, third party smoke or something like that. And the, the, the fact that we can't draw kind of tight lines for epistemic reasons isn't going to impugn any justification of that kind. And I think if that's the case, then we should be cautious about appealing to that kind of reasoning to impugn automation taxes. No. But I take the point, yeah. I, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I have uh, two different questions. Uh, the, the first one deals with the issue that you brought up about liability for taxation. Yeah. And so, you know, most of the kinds of liability I'm familiar with talk about some inevitable cost or harm and how to be distributed fairly. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not sure you can kind of make this kind of blanket claim that you did without coming 
to brief with some counterintuitive results. Okay. So imagine firm A, yeah. uh, which does not engage in new automation, but is extremely successful in its profits. Yeah. Uh, firm B undergoes automation and has moderate uh, financial success. So with your cor corporate tax scheme, you're yeah. going to be placing the burden on the very successful non-automating yeah. company. Yeah. Even though the company that created the yeah. burden to society yeah. is not being viewed as being liable. And I, I found that kind of counterintuitive. Kind of really? Okay. Uh, and, and so the second thing, and this is kind of like more of the invitation to say something more perhaps about this language of, uh, I, I was struck with your, your use of uh, job creation yeah. as kind of magical dust. Uh, we'll just sprinkle job creation on yeah. there and everything will be okay. But if you, know, you look at you know various regions, especially, you know, I think about you know, West Virginia or something like this. Yeah. In the United States, job creation is incredibly difficult and slow and stagnated, and it's not as though we can expect as automation picks up and as your golden boy of Silicon Valley loses jobs because we're writing code to write code. Yeah. Uh, you know that this is somehow going to, you know, be that effective. Okay. Good. But there were any challenges. Um, so. Let's take the, the first one. Um, suppose there are um, there are two firms, both of which uh, have large, uh, but both both of which um, have small workforces, uh, technology, um, and they make huge profits. Um, tax are both equally. Um, suppose that one of them then says, actually, we've realised that we're going to expand our workforce instead, um, just because. We're going to make marginally more money that way. Um, can they say, um, "Look, now we're less responsible for the problem. We, we've now employed all these individuals. We're, 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 let, we're responsible for the plight, for the demand for compensation to, to less of a degree than the other firm. We want to be let off the hook because of this. We want to have a lower tax burden." Um, I find that deeply counterintuitive to think that that's to think that they can appeal to that kind of reasoning. But one reason you might think they can is you often hear um, kind of CEOs of firms saying this. They say, I deserve a lower level of tax because I'm providing this public benefit. I'm, I'm providing this, this great benefit. I'm giving people jobs. And by making this valuable social contribution, I morally deserve to fare better than the individual who's managing this firm uh, with, with few employees. Um, so if you thought that arguments from moral desert were forceful, then, then you might have a, a good reason to impose taxes on, on the firms that automate. Um, but I don't think that arguments from moral desert are going to be forceful, at least in the level of political morality, how we think about setting up institutions. I think we should be sceptical of, of appealing to arguments based on desert. Um, th there might also be an argument based on the kind of public good and free riding, and there's a kind of argument that might develop on that, those lines. But again, I think that, that's going to fail. Um, in the second, can you remind me of the second issue again? And I'll try to be quick. Well, I mean, I'm not sure you addressed the first one, but the, the second one was, you know, more of an invitation to say what you're thinking of when you use a language. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, again, again that's, that's really that's really important. So, um, my view certainly might be interpreted as kind of utopian in the sense that. It's supposed that governments can create jobs like that, when of, when of course they can. Um, but I, I do also think that we should um, we should recognise that governments haven't made good faith efforts to drive job creation, at least in a wide range of, of regions and industries. Um, so we haven't seen, for example, the use of what I take to be a particularly good way of creating jobs, basic income. So supplying people with, with regular cash payments that they can then use and which as a result of the multiplier effect is going to increase the demand for new form of employment. So I don't think I don't think basic income is going to be a kind of golden solution to this. It's going to suddenly lead to you know plummeting levels of unemployment. But I do think that we should be open to the possibility of a much wider range of policies than we've previously seen. Um, and at the moment governments have been fairly narrow minded in the kind of attack that they've taken in order to drive job creation. Uh, just a quick question. So, yeah. 
in the response to the sort of Pareto argument, you sort of make this claim about how maybe compensation is not adequate. Yeah. Right, in the, the Boolean case. Yeah. Uh, but then I wonder, how do you reconcile that with your proposal, which does seem to be a compensation scheme, right? So, uh, yeah. Is there like yeah. a relevant difference here? No, no, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. So my concern with the, uh, well, the reason that I invoked the, the Boolean, Sean Schiffering's Boolean case as a reply to the Pareto was just to say, it's not obvious that all Pareto improvements are justifiable. So in the case of the, the aircraft, the mere fact that each of us stands to benefit, including those who are hit benefit, isn't always sufficient to justify the policy. Of course, in some cases it will be. So if the bullion is shaped such that each of us will suffer only a, a minor injury, uh, a skin blemish, and what we'll get is 50 billion, 50 billion dollars for a skin blemish, and there's no other way that the eccentric billionaire can deliver the money, then I'm inclined to think that's justifiable. So all I wanted to do is resist the, the really quite ambitious claim that merely benefiting is always sufficient to justify, and I don't think that's true. And I mean, Sean Schiffer's case demonstrates that compellingly. Um, so what that suggests is that we need to look at the distribution of benefits and burdens in a, in a more, you know, kind of, inspect them more closely. And it's going to turn out that, in some cases, if the benefits are great, the burdens are small, that's going to be sufficient to justify the policy. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. You focus on the responsibility or the involvement of burdens. Yeah, but it's not quite clear that burns are always the place where the technology that produces automation begins. Yeah. It's oftentimes universities or yeah. other centers of knowledge. Yeah. So wouldn't the disincentive argument also apply to the centers of knowledge production? Yeah. And what would your reply be? Because yeah. that already impinges on freedom of, uh, of the production of knowledge. Yeah. So just why would you even say that firms in the free market are yeah. compelled to adopt uh, automation in order to make competitive. Right. So, in a sense, the causal chain comes before that. In yeah. The production of technology. Yeah. So, I think that the advocates of automation taxes, of course, are not one, are going to say that what's important is that we increase the range of options available to firms, and then, providing the right policies are in place, they can select between them as, as they want. So we should continue to innovate and drive technology and make sure there are a, a much larger range of options available for firms so that they can automate if they want. But the social cost of automating should be factored into the price. So advocates of automation taxes aren't going to say limit the opportunities to automate in the sense of deprive them of the technology. They instead want to say ensure that that technology is appropriately priced so that, so that if they adopt it, and they're paying the costs of that. There's a question right in the back corner. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. Hi. Yes. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, I, I am very sympathetic to a lot of your arguments, and uh, I especially agree that there is a collective responsibility to you know, do something about yeah. the effects of automation and unemployment. But I just wonder uh, why limit your proposal to unemployment benefits and job creation schemes that aren't all that uh, <coughs> ambitious or radical. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So um, the reason for it is simply that I want to remain as ecumenical as I can. So I want to say, look, with this fairly modest suite of policies, we're able to defend uh, we're, we're, able to, we're able to provide an objection to automation taxes. So just relying on this fairly modest set of policies, I think that's going to do the trick. As it happens, I in fact think the best way of meeting these demands is going to be through more radical reform. So as, I, I've, as I've kind of already hinted, I think basic income is going to be a, a really crucial part of this. I think basic income is going to supply, is going to be superior to unemployment benefits, and I think it's going to drive job creation. It's also going to give people a certain amount of income that they can use for, for job retraining, for example. So I do think that strategically it helps to note that a fairly modest set of policies is going to do the trick. But of course, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that 
other more radical policies that will do the trick better, or, as is in fact the case, that we have additional reasons to favour more radical policies rather than the more modest ones. By that I mean that from the perspective of the disincentive argument, we should be indifferent between the, the more modest proposals and the more radical ones. But of course, from the perspective of, for example, gender equality or racial equality, we might have specific reasons to favour one set of policies over the other. So I'm, I'm just presenting a kind of tentative or, or a partial case that we might supplement with additional reasons so that have a different character. Any other radical suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, please Great. join me in thanking Tom.